Good evening, everyone. It is seven o'clock. I know everyone's been working and everyone's had a long day, and we do appreciate you coming on this webinar. Um, it's getting a little bit late, obviously, and we have short time with Dr. Webb and Dr. Beal tonight. And we do appreciate from the rest of the IZI team, we do appreciate everyone coming on. And we're excited about the topic tonight. Um, it's going to be about the HV cement that we have just kind of launched this year. Um, we have it with insight beads and these insight particles that are inside the cement make it a lot easier to see. Tonight, we were very fortunate to be able to schedule some time with uh, some of the clinical experts, Dr. Douglas Beal and Dr. James Webb. Um, they were the first ever users of the cement. They helped us make sure that we tweaked everything right, gave us some great feedback uh, until it was ready for prime time, if you will, and now it's actually launched into the field um, because of the extensive amount of uh, cement they have been using, we have asked them to give us some insight of their usage, talking about what they have used that cement for, where they use it in the cases, and why this cement is kind of above and beyond the other cements that are offered here today. Everyone here who's on this call has seen some type of bone cement that has um, used in either for triboplasty or kyphoplasty. And while ours differs, it just allows these tracking beads to allow the physician to see real-time flow visualization. And also because it's coupled with the high viscosity of the cement, the application for it for a hypoplasty is excellent. Thank you, Jovi. Appreciate it. So the cement is called uh, Vertifix HV, and it is HV in air quotes. So Whatever people think about viscosity in cement, for the purest in the crowd, this is kind of a medium viscosity cement. I'll touch on that. So high viscosity cement means you can actually control it pretty well. And this uh, will have 350 pascal seconds, as we'll discuss, coming straight out of the box after two and a half minutes. Uh, basically, it's a mix and go type cement. And it has a very flat curve. So it, it's, it, it attains the 350 pascal seconds in viscosity, and this will stay flat for quite a long period of time. And so, uh, and after that, it's got 18, this is kind of the rules of 18 is what uh, Vertifix HV is. So it's uh, 18 minutes of working time. It has 18 cc's of cement. And so you mix it in about uh, two, uh, about just a few seconds after you finish mixing and loading whatever apparatus you're going to deliver the cement into the vertebral body. It's a 350 pa pascal seconds of viscosity, it's toothpaste. And so it's a mix and go, and it stays flat, and it increases in thickness uh, fairly slowly, uh, much more at body temperature, of course. And it's got 18 cc's of total usability. And so one of the issues that I have with cement is there's not enough of it. So you, you mix a cement, you very often will get between about 10 and 14 cc's of cement, sometimes as little as eight cc's of cement, depending on what you're using. That is not enough to cement, uh, cement to fix two vertebral bodies and to do an optimal job. It just is not. And so the viscosity is really nice. It's a mix and go. Uh, and it also has indicator beads. So these are called insight tracking beads. And these beads are something if you use any type of uh, remote delivery, anything except for a bone filler we with metal on metal apposition, you can actually feel when the cement is flowing with your hands if you inject it through the needle, <clears throat> if you inject it through any type of tubing, especially if you're using a pressure device, this will actually watch the cement go down and you can see the cement flow with the indicator beads the insight tracking beads there's been a lot of uh, radio pacification agents used over time there's been barium and that's the most common zirconium uh, uh, tungsten uh, there's been <clears throat> lots of different types of opacifying agents but this is barium with non-homogeneous beads and so these are little clumps of barium uh, sulfate that will allow you to monitor the, the tracking over time so you can watch the cement as it actually flows. This is very radiopaque. This is 30% by weight, sterile barium. Uh, and so this is one of the, the uh, substantial opacity is one of the really optimal characteristics of this. And the ability to watch it flow is something that's completely unique. Uh, there was a previous cement on the market that is no longer on the market. 
that I found this to be a, a, an agent that was very useful, a, a characteristic of the cement that was very useful. Next slide. So the uh, you can sing the ants go marching two by two down the needle as this thing uh, is injected in. You can see uh, the barium beads uh, go down along with the, the rest of the homogeneous type um, of the barium. And this provides an observation of flow, yes, but it also provides an observation of collection of cement. So um, you can tell when it's flowing. You can also tell where the cement is going to a greater degree than some of the other areas. And cement distribution inside a vertebral body is not homogeneous. It depends on the bone. It depends on how much sclerosis is there. It depends on whether or not, or not, or not there's a cleft there. And every type of collection uh, can give you an indicator as to what the bone is doing. It can also give you an indicator, uh, an early indicator, if you're extravasating, for example, paraspinal out the side of the side wall as you're watching from it laterally. Next slide. Actually, hey, Doug, if I may interrupt you, I got sure. a question from user O2. Wanted yep. to know yep. if the consistency or I guess the viscosity is the same from the time that you mixed it until the time that you're done injecting. It's very much the same. It rarely goes above 450 Pascal seconds. So if you inject this, it like any other cement, you know, th this has, uh, you know, toluene and benzoyl peroxide as an initiator. And so this will initiate and the polymerization will happen in a, linear, a very linear fashion as long as it's on the back table, as long as it's at, at uh, uh, the temperature that your operating suite or your uh, fluoroscopy suite is. Once it goes into the body, the, the polymerization accelerates fairly rapidly. So the other characteristic of this cement is that it's uh, fairly temperature sensitive. So it polymerizes at a much higher body temperature, but yes, the answer to that question is it stays very, very uh, flat in that, that viscosity curve, just like you saw, that stays very flat um, as you go out. So you see on the the uh, the axis at the bottom, I mean, th this is minutes, this um, x-axis at the bottom, and it the, the, the goes all the way up to about, um, uh, it's kind of a, a graduated y-axis, but it stays very flat and linear. And as you know, when I said this is kind of a medium viscosity cement, some of the really high viscosity cements, uh, like the competent cement, uh, some of the cement by uh, by Mendec HV, I mean, this stuff is over a thousand Pascal seconds. And once you get up to a Pascal, thousand Pascal seconds, I mean, it's really thick. It's hard to inject. You can't inject by any other mechanism other than a pressure crank, some, something that will build up a lot of pressure. And cement by nature, is hydrophobic so it will tend to ball up and really not get into the cracks and crevices as much so it's a balance between the ability of the cement to distribute itself where it needs to go into the fracture clefts uh, but still maintain control of a higher viscosity cement so this is more really of a higher viscosity medium viscosity cement so let's go back to uh, the previous slide there but thank that's, you doug appreciate yeah, that that's, appropriate characteristics. This is uh, designed for maximum cement control, and this is also uh, designed for the usability to actually get into the fracture clefts or uh, the fracture uh, gaps wherever you want, want it to go. It still has the capability to, uh, to displace itself into those crevices. Next slide. I'll go ahead and just get past that. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Webb that's going to talk a little bit more about the cement, and then we will show you a few cases and then wind it up in the end with a question and answer. And feel free to ask the questions at any point in time along. That's, that's why this is, this is being done, so people can get good real-time feedback. Um, over to you, Dr. Webb. Hey, Dr. Bill. Thanks. Yeah, I'm uh, really loving the cement uh, for a long time. It's, it's been a long time since we've had uh, this type of cement where you have some markers where you can get the uh, kind of ants marching in a row kind of visualization of the cement that gives you some more feedback. Uh, and it's re been really helpful. I would agree with uh, Doug on pretty much all those comments. It seems very stable uh, in uh, consistency from a practical standpoint when I'm using it. Uh, the only times I really come into accelerized polymerization is if the room's hot or uh, if uh, 
sometimes if I, you know, if you make a technical error there and you get like a high pressure in the, in the, uh, the tube that you're drawing it out in, uh, for, a, and forget to like back off of it, that can increase the pressure just like any other cement. But really overall, the usability has been, been great. Uh, the inside tracking beads are, are really useful. Uh, a lot of times, like on this, on this, uh, image we're seeing here on the bottom right, uh, you can see sometimes they'll clump together. I found a few times you'll see, uh, it seems like they'll kind of clump together and make kind of a, a clued a vein, like kind of embolize a vein within the vertebral body when you're in there. So that's kind of, I think that's one of the things that seems from a practical standpoint to help limit extravasation. Uh, where, you know, not that you don't ever get extravasation, but it just seems uh, to me that a lot of those, uh, those particles are kind of, tend to kind of embolize a little bit more. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, here, here's some practical examples, really, in using a, you know, a curved uh, delivery system. You can see pre-existing cement below in the middle picture, uh, you can, in the middle vertebral body, the upper one that's being uh, instrumented. You can see pre-existing cement down there pretty solid um, with a different cement, and you can see pretty clearly where you're adding the uh, new HV cement uh, separately. So it, it is useful in seeing where that's going in instability clefts and different parts of the vertebral body that you're filling. Um, I, that's where I find it very useful in, uh, in revision cases. Uh, and also, sometimes we don't really have, let's go to the next page there. Uh, here, here's an, another example, I think, on a revision sacroplasty. So if you're looking, this is, well, this is one duck says, I'm not going to talk about it. Uh, go on, uh, are we, oh, that's the case study. Go, sorry. You can go back. Hey, Jim, I can jump on this. Just yeah, go, go ahead and jump on. Let's talk about that one. Yeah. Sure. So this is a sacroplasty revision. So there's, uh, a real good old college try there in the image on your left. There's not really not uh, sufficient enough cement. And in your mind's eye, if you can visualize that fracture and you can visualize the cleft and you know there's not enough cement to glue that, that fracture back together, there's not enough cement injected into the bone you're trying to fix the fracture in. So what uh, this is a revision with uh, uh, the Vertifix HV. You can see it's kind of a hook shot into uh, S2 below the area of prior um, sacroplasty, and the benefit there is you can uh, look ex and see exactly where the cement is flowing. And this uh, this did flow into the SI joint, and that was purposeful because some of this uh, cement that was existing in the sacrum started to break down the uh, opposite ilium. And so you can see there's a collection in the in, in the image on the far right. There is a collection of uh, cement right there, the dense collection there, and that, that corresponded with an area of ilium fracturing. The other uh, thing I like about the indicator beads, other than flow, is whenever they collect into an area of, of density, you, it, it tells you something. I mean, are you having extravasation outside of the uh, vertebral body or sacrum? Or more importantly, is that going into the area of fracture clefts? So when it, whenever you look at this beforehand, you can actually see where it's going. You can, and the, the center view uh, is a pelvic inlet view to make sure we're not extravasating anteriorly. We can see it lined up along the cortex. Uh, we can see exactly where the line share of the cement is going to, to match up with, in your mind's eye of what you know to be fractured within that bone. Next slide. And this is just an example of real-time flow. You can see that's uh, a real example of a lumbar fracture, and this is just going down in. You can see it going in and see it um, um, flowing, just like in the image, the fracture on the image above. Uh, it's already been in, and it's uh, it's flowing. You can see it's, it's good, consistent, homogeneous, and this is just what it looks like in a real patient. Next slide. And pursuant to what I was talking about just a second ago, the image on, in the middle here looks like a V on its side. And this is going into the fracture clefts. And uh, the T7, once it was kind of, I ballooned it a little bit, and but I really wanted to, uh, to fill the fracture clefts. It kind of looks even a little bit like an X. So you have a fracture cleft 
just subjacent to the spear end plate and kind of along the inferior end plate. So you can tell the uh, indicator beads, inside tracking beads are um, going in that cleft. And that's exactly what we saw on the, uh, the pre-op MRI. And so this is something you can tell. And this is when you, when you know you're finished. So how do you know you're finished? It goes from end plate to end plate between the pedicles. That's how you know you're finished. And the majority of people do not, uh, that I've seen do not fill quite enough cement. How much is enough cement? It's between 15 and 30 percent of the non-compressed vertebral body volume. So this is uh, there's uh, commonly this is a T7. I mean the the uh, T7 should be kind of in the range of almost four to almost five, depending on. Uh, the size of the individual, and the greatest difference between how much cement you use is, is whether the patient is a male or female. Men just have larger bones, hence, <clears throat> therefore, require more cement. Next slide. So here's a great example of a kyphoplasty where you can see the ants in a row, like ants marching down the delivery canyon. In the first picture on the left, you can see some a few dots there and see the configuration of that in the delivery cannula. And then you can see it as it changes configuration on in the cannula on the right side of the image, as well as in the vertebral body. And the reason I, I took this picture was actually there was a little bit of cement in one of the veins uh, going back to the lungs, potentially. And you can see a dot just uh, above the level that we're treating, the level that's been treated before, there's a little dot in the front on the left side of the image and then on the right you can see the change in position between the two so that shows you that you're actually getting some cement in that vein uh, so that can be a big warning sign that you need to stop uh, you need to probably reposition your cannula maybe let the cement set up a little bit differently uh, or just change your tactics there i call those evasive maneuvers usually just moving your cannula position will help uh, because a lot of times the tip of the cannula is just like in one of those venous channels that's going back into the basic vertebral plexus Next slide. So here's a revision case. Um, if you look on the side on the right, or the slide on the right, uh, you know, it looks like a really good superior inferior end plate column of uh, PMMA there before, uh, but there is a little deficit on the left. And, you know, this patient was initially treated back in 2007, so about four years ago. And they did well after that case, uh, but sometimes people will refracture. It seems to be more common in patients with low bone quality or what we generally call secondary osteoporosis. And this is one of those patients. So on the image on the left, we kind of see the approach from the lateral view. I mean, it looks pretty much completely filled out, probably, you know, uh, probably about 90% of the area on the lateral view and probably about 80% of the uh, cross-sectional area on the right-sided frontal view. Let's go to the next page. So here we've got the... Uh, the access needle and the delivery cannula has already been placing some cement in this revision case. So, um, you know, on a revision, when you've got a clear area of, of uh, PMMA paucity, like where there's an area where you can obviously get a needle in, uh, that's usually the place to go. Uh, Cross-sectional imaging, whether that's a CAT scan as a pre-procedure planning, or even just looking at your MRI, uh, axial, and uh, other plan multiplanar images can usually give you a good clue of where you're most likely to get the needle in. Sometimes you have to just hug the superior end plate, but this one looked kind of like a chip shot. But uh, the nice thing about uh, the Vertifix HV cement is we can see these beads here, and you can tell the difference from where, you can really see where you're putting in the new glue versus the old glue. Uh, and again, not a lot of change on the right side of the image lateral. Uh, you can tell if you compare that uh, to the previous, there's a little bit more density in the back part, but uh, definitely helps you see, even on that, lateral image, you can see some diffuse uh, markers kind of going up into almost almost to the anterior column there. Let's go to the next slide. So here's just a comparison from the, from the top left, there's the initial lateral view and the bottom left is the post revision view. And it's subtle, but you can see an increased density in the back half of the vertebral body in the middle column, still kind of staying away from that posterior wall. Uh, compared to the one before. So that's where most of this new cement uh, went. And you can also see the beads in there that kind of help show you where the new cement is. So obviously if you do more than one revision or you treated a case uh, with, with that before, it's sometimes hard to tell what's new, but if you compare your start and end uh, procedure images, even if you had beads in there before, you can see the configuration and uh, kind of get an idea of the change. And then on the right side of the images on the top, we see the starting 
uh, which is the marker where the patient was uh, closed fist percussion positive the spinous process before the procedure. And then on the bottom right, the end procedure uh, with you know, way more filled out, pretty much you know, 98% filled out on the cross-sectional image on that AP. There's a little bit of a uh, little bit of new glue in some lateral veins, but that's kind of what will happen when you uh, completely fill out a vertebral body. Let's go to the next slide. So uh, this next case is she's a 63 year old female with what I would call type three osteoporosis. This hasn't, you know, we're kind of working on terminology. Classically, we think of, uh, you know, back in the old days, osteoporosis just happened. You know, it's just part of normal aging. But then that ignored the fact that you have 103 year old patients who never get a fracture, and you've got 60 year old patients who get a hip fracture, right? Uh, then people that treated osteoporosis, you know, started seeing well, it's not just bone density. People can have a normal bone density test and get fractures. Uh, for example, um, steroid-induced osteoporosis. So then we had this concept of, of osteoporosis as part bone quality and part bone density. Um, and that works pretty well, but then we start seeing uh, patients, uh, for example, steroid-induced osteoporosis patients tend to lose density and have low bone quality, more prone to refracture, uh, and they tend to start getting fractures even at higher bone density. Uh, just because the steroid toxic effect on bones. Now we're seeing, uh, you know, in the 2020s, a lot of patients uh, like on long-term SSRI, PPI, uh, diabetes, uh, thyroid, you know, all these, all these medical issues that can cause osteoporosis that we didn't know 20, 30 years ago. And a lot of times these patients have like almost normal bone density, but they've just got really terrible bone quality. So I kind of, I tend to refer to those as like a type three osteoporosis because uh, it is a little bit different than what we classically think of quote unquote secondary osteoporosis with steroids. So uh, this was a patient, even though I said that, she had a really low uh, BMD, I'm sorry, yeah, BMD in her ward. So her others were were not too, uh, not too bad when we first started her seeing her, but now she's kind of caught up with that. Her bone, her bone density is caught up with the bone quality. Um, Anyway, so she's she's one of those that has these risk factors of the chronic SSRI use, severe diabetes. It's you know it's not very well controlled. Uh, I think she had an A1C of like in the eights. Um, unfortunately, she hasn't been able to uh, tolerate any kind of medication. Like she wasn't able to tolerate oral bisphosphonates, and she uh, didn't. Even, she had trouble with like uh, Teo even. So. Uh, and they've still had trouble keeping her vitamin D up even with supplementation. So we back two years ago we treated her T5. And so now she's got a recurrent fracture of T5. Let's go to the next slide. So uh, this is a patient with that kind of low bone quality. She looks like so she looks like she's pretty filled out. Okay, so we've got an access needle here. I'm showing you the uh, osteocyte curette that uh, is kind of useful sometimes to get in these uh, fracture planes below and above because sometimes these patients will just get a you know like a really small narrow window fracture uh, along the end plate. So uh, this is just to show that she's got, it looks pretty well filled out uh, on the frontal view. Let's go to the next slide. So here's a lateral view with the needle. Uh, this is also coming from an inferior, modified inferior end plate approach. You can, uh, there's a great article by uh, a guy named Dr. Doug Beal <laughs> on that. Um, so we're going from the in inferior end plate from a further out angle uh, to avoid nerve damage. And so once we get in there, on you can see on the right, uh, there's a frontal view of injecting uh, the new uh, Vertifix HV cement underneath there. And you can kind of see that. We'll show in just a, a minute compared to before. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so here we are at kind of terminal injection. You can start to see uh, on the right side, right below that uh, vertebral body is being filled. It almost looks like a little boot or something in the in the disc and that's more dense than everything else, those are the markers, okay? Those are some of the markers that are going out into the disc. And on the lateral view on the left, uh, kind of see that same thing from the lateral side. So let's go to the next slide. So that last, that uh, let's, yeah, let's back up there. So really what made, I stopped here because we'd filled that really nice and you can see on the, on the right sided frontal view, uh, you've really, this is kind of angled to see the end plate on the inferior aspect of that vertebral body. And that's really filled out a flat along there. And you can see where there's just a little crack where some of the glue's going into the disc. And at that point, uh, that's preferentially where it was going. So I stopped injecting because it doesn't do us any good in the disc, but uh, I'm not, I'm not concerned at all about an adjacent level fracture because it's a really nice superior plate fill on the one that's adjacent. So 
that's it on these. Yeah, we can open it up to more questions and comments, but this is, uh, as Jim said, this is uh, one of the first new bone cements in quite some time. It's been years since there's uh, been a, a nice bone cement that's out that has a lot of different types of um, attributes to it. And if I were to pick out the cement that I would use as my fastball, the one that has the greatest amount of utility, one that's the easiest to control, the easiest to see, the one that really you can rely on is you, your utilitarian cement. I mean, this is it. This has been uh, one of my favorite things that I've used in quite some time. And whenever you stop using uh, a system and you graduate on to a next one, a lot of times there's experimentation and you kind of use one system versus the other versus the next. And, this is one of those areas that it was a long time in the making. I, <laughs> I, I knew this was coming out. I kept waiting on it, and uh, yeah. I, I'm really more pleased to, to use something, I think. And, and when this finally came about, I mean, it, it, it will not disappoint. This is my favorite cement. Yeah. Thank you, Doug. I tell you what, I know we're running out a little bit of time here, so maybe we can go right to the questions and answer unless there's anything else. Uh, Dr. Beal or Dr. Webb, you'd like to add? Yeah, you know, I would add that I, I've really enjoyed working with ICI. It's nice to have a company that uh, is not only innovative, but uh, listens to physician input. Uh, bringing this, this cement to market has been a great thing. Another uh, thing on that slide there is the curved needle that they have. We haven't really had one of those uh, in the market uh, for a while, and so it's really nice to be able to use to deliver. It just gives you a little bit easier way to deliver across the vertebral body, uh, especially in revisions, for example, or just in those uh, very. They're also very useful in the vertebral plane fractures. They just smush down, and it's hard to hard to get around there because centrally it's just crushed. But on the periphery of the vertebral body, there's still space to get that needle around there. It's just easier to fill the cleft all the time without getting as much extravasation. So thanks, IZI, for bringing those two great things. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Webb. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So actually, I'm going to start with a couple of questions. We have three questions so far. And again, if you would like to ask any other questions, all you have to do is click on that red box with the arrow onto it. And that red box will pop out a control panel. And from there, you'll see a section called questions. You can type your question right in there, and uh, we'll we'll post it on top of, uh, of what we're doing right now. So the first question we have, it looks like it's kind of a two-part question. Uh, do you have to adjust your imaging equipment to to visualize the insight uh, the insight beads? Flash. Do you have to use any specific equipment? So um, I'll go ahead and take this one, Jeff. It's a so this is a 30% sterile barium. And uh, the 30% by weight uh, makes the conspicuity really optimal, regardless of what you're using. So this is, uh, I've used this under uh, a serum called GenoRay. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it's made for uh, people that weigh like less than 100 pounds. I mean, anybody, anybody over that has difficulty penetrating. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is, uh, this is good for, any type of equipment, if I can see it well under that CRM, but I can see it under anything. So yeah, no special right. equipment needed. And uh, this is the most commonly used of pacifying agent. It's just um, whatever you, the barium comes out and it's milled, it gets milled and, and you have a combination of heterogeneous and homogeneous barium. And that's what accounts for the, uh, the uh, insight tracking beads, that appearance. Thank you very much. Um, let's see, the next question. Have you ever had the beads clog within the needle again or at the tip? Are you talking about you the guys, occlusion? Um, I don't know. That was just kind of the question that popped through. My guess is they probably mean that uh, like the beads may stack up like boulders and all of a sudden you can't get the cement through. I've done lots of cases with this i haven't had that happen in vivo uh, i have had it happen occasionally when i'm filling the tubes uh, or i've had it happen once is the only time that i can think of uh, just like any other cement you can get like a little dry clot in there sometimes it's an inadequate mixing or whatever is probably what happened in that case 
I've never had a, an issue with the beads kind of stacking up like that. And in vivo, in the patients I've seen, I haven't had any issues. Uh, for example, you know, with other cements that are using at high pressure, that's where I usually see people have, uh, when, when I see the occasional catastrophic complication case that somebody shows me that they weren't watching under, under fluoro while they're injecting, it's usually a high pressure system. And a lot of times that's a buildup either of cement in a tip uh, in vivo or maybe the the delivery cannula is jammed up against the trabecular or the cortex, and then it slips back or whatever. Pressure builds up and comes back, and then, then you have this massive amount of cement come out. Uh, I haven't really had anything uh, that I've been uncomfortable with with the HB cement here. So, uh, uh, Jovi, I'm just going to take a, a short answer on this. this uh, the answer is no. This works about the same as, as any other cement. But what, uh, what the question deals with, I think, is a, a concept called filter packing. And so whenever you push something at, with high pressure, a stylet, through any type of uh, powder polymer, liquid monomer type mixture, sometimes you can press out the liquid, leaving the power, powder behind. Uh, and that comes out of solution and that it creates a little plug and that's called that process is an engineering term called filter packing and so to do that um, it, it's a lot easier to do it with a beveled needle in a cannula than it is a diamond tip needle so if you're pushing it into a bevel it tends to push it into one side so this is, if you're having difficulty if our, uh, if our listeners having difficulty with this uh, try to reinsert the diamond tip back into the needle. That'll make the reinsertion a lot easier and make it so where it's not so prone to filter packing. Great, thank you. All right, let's see the next question we have here from Jacob Fleming. Thank you, Dr. Beal and Dr. Webb for a great talk. In a practice sense, how do you integrate this cement into your practice if you are using vertebral augmentation kits from other manufacturers? who often have their own cement along with a proprietary cement delivery device. Would you say the additional cost is worth the improved experience slash outcome? I guess that's a two-parter. Well, I, 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 can, uh, I can address that, Jacob. So I, I used for years, I used a Medtronic system with uh, a Smith & Nephew cement. <laughs> so I mean, I just, you just, in lieu of the uh, HVR or Activos 10 or or uh, or one of the other cements from a specific manufacturer. Uh, instead of buying that, we just buy the the cement of choice. And so this this one will work uh, with any different system. I've used this with a number of different, different systems. Um, this is um, not only comparably priced. This is priced toward the uh, definitely more affordable uh, end. I mean, this is one of the most affordable cements that I've encountered. So you can just you can use this with every cement with every system that's on the market. I have not used it with every single system that's on the market, but close. So it's in, in lieu of the cement that comes um, as part of the package, whether or not you use Maristrike or Medtronic or whoever, you just get, you can instead of that you can uh, use this and give it a, give it a go. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, next question, does the cement perform better with an injector or bone fillers? Is the B con is uh, essentially for B consistency? I, I don't see any difference between the two on B consistency at all. Yeah, I, I've used it through bone fillers, a needle, um, just you, you see it being used to a curved needle here. Um, it, it just it has good characteristics and again with this kind of medium slash high viscosity bone cement you can inject it pretty easily through whatever you need to some of the high viscosity cements uh, are very difficult to inject through anything smaller than you know a larger tube or a 11 gauge needle but this this is uh, has some utility to it so it's, it's very easy to use with a number of different systems Great, thank you very much. All right, looks like we have another question from Dr. Fleming. Dr. Webb's point about the beads sometimes clumping up and maybe embolizing um, an intervertebral vein, preventing central embolization, brings to mind embolos, oh my goodness gracious, embolotherapy principles from vascular IR, like using beads of a 
deliberate size to limit the possible non-target embolization. Are the beads in the cement any specific size range or could be further improved to further lower the chance of cement embolization? Whew. That's a good question. I mean, Doug, you're, you're more on the interventional side than... Yeah, so uh, Jacob, I, I think that would have to be <clears throat> really studied. The, the, uh, the increased bead size here really kind of relates to the heterogeneity of the barium. Um, I've not anecdotally noticed any difference in embolization into vessels versus non. And is it possible that there might be a difference? Absolutely, it might be possible. I think that would have to be left up to investigation. So if we take just all comers, I mean, how many times are you getting cement extravasation into uh, the veins that go to the lungs? Well, it depends on how hard you look. So, <laughs> you know, the Venman's <laughs> This is Bertos, um, part of the Bertos series. Uh, Venman's reported uh, a range of 26%, you know, of uh, of extravasation for pulmonary emboli. So it goes all the way from Kim's 5% to Venman's 26%. I mean, it goes all the way from you know uh, one in 20 to being more prevalent than the, the prevalence of blue eyes in the United States. So I mean, this is something that really kind of can happen commonly and. Yeah, you know, I, I've noticed that uh, I don't have a lot of extravasation issues with Vertifex HV, but, you know, is that because of the increased viscosity characteristics, the, uh, the increased Pascal seconds that it goes, or, or is, it, is it some other independent phenomenon? To that, I would ha have to give you a solid, I don't know, answer. And uh, Dr. Fleming, I can actually chan I can actually probably get that information. By the way, Jacob said thank you very much. Um, but I can probably get that information from our engineering team, and I'll go ahead and uh, send that out to you for the specific size. Um, just as a reminder, again, if anyone has any other questions before I ask the next question, uh, there is that red box that has a little arrow on it on your upper right-hand side of your screen that pops out a control panel. From there, you'll see a small section with a little carrot arrow that says questions. You click that down, you'll see a little white box where you can type in your question. So let's go on to the next question. It looks like oh, we're kind of get kind of close, but uh, let's uh, ask the next question. It's question is how long does it take to set up once in the vertebral body prior to moving the patient? So I'm guessing what they're asking is after injection, what is the actual setting time? And Maybe, maybe since we have varying temperatures in different rooms and whatnot, um, I can first give a generic answer, which is obviously depending on what the temperature was during injection, where the cement was stored and everything. In general, we have an IFU or the injection phase can run from like 18 to 20 minutes. And then the actual setting phase per our IFU is 20 minutes to 29 minutes. Um, Doug, James, is, is does that sound about right in practice? Is that what you're typically seeing? That's probably right. I mean, I've seen some cases where I've been able to still inject the cement at 25 minutes. Um, I've had some cases where, you know, that's almost always room temperature variation, you know. Sometimes we're in sets up by 17 minutes. Uh, from a practical standpoint, uh, more than worried about when I can get the patient off the table, uh, I'm more worried about when it's set up and safe for me to pull the needle out. Uh, and I really am not seeing problems with the cement for me. So a good general rule is you can cut the time uh, for polymerization and hardening in half when it's in the body. So by the time, you know, even if it's uh, 20 minutes uh, of working time or 24 minutes on the back table, it's going to be no more than 10 to 12 uh, before it really is very, quite hard in the body. So. Um, I think if you're, you know, if, if you're worrying about when to move the patient, uh, you know, you're you're ungodly fast with your procedure. <laughs> so I think uh, I would have to say, you know, number one, just don't worry about it. I mean, it's uh, if you're if you're finishing uh, a, a single level in, uh, you know, in six minutes and you're starting to move, you know, probably uh, as as Jim said, when, whenever you take the needle out, you'll get a tail, and so. Tails don't really mean anything, it's, it, especially if you go 
transpedicular because it just fills the pathway through the pedicle. But it does make you lose style points because it, it, it looks bad. So the, the real test of it is by the time you take the needle out, if the cement doesn't flow back along the track, the path of least resistance, it's by the time you get the band-aids or the derma bond on the patient, and uh, by the time you finish um, taking the drapes off and everything else, the cement will be plenty hard to uh, to go ahead and move them. So you, you really shouldn't have an issue with this. Great. Thank you very much. I think this question is actually uh, directed more to IZI. Someone asked, is this FDA cleared and commercially available? The answer is yes, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> it was first obviously given to Dr. Beal and Dr. Webb. If you want to get their opinion first, this was uh, earlier in the year, but now it is uh, since the summer it has launched. It is commercially available. Um, if you don't know who your IZI rep is or not sure about who to contact, um, on this invite, there is a Amanda Shannon. Um, her email address is amanda.shannon.com, but it's actually where you got the information for the login and whatnot. Feel free to contact her, and she'll make sure that your rep receives your information um, and then gets a rep out to you as soon as possible. Um, let's see. Any other questions I have? And I think that is it. That is all the other questions were just ones I think are directed more for IZI pricing and everything else. So we'll go ahead and uh, make sure that we get in touch with those who have asked the questions are a little bit more directed for uh, non-clinical. And we'll go ahead and make sure we get back out to you. Uh, I'd like to thank, anything you'd like to add left, Doug, James? Yeah, uh, super big thanks to uh, Jovi and Amanda from IZI. We appreciate you guys. Uh, this is a, a wonderful product we really enjoyed using. Big thanks to uh, the great Dr. Webb. Thanks for uh, it's really, really good to see you, Jim. It's good to be on the uh, the uh, webinar with you. And uh, this has been a lot of fun. Thanks for taking time out of your evening to join us. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to add thanks, Doug, for being uh, on here. It's nice to see you. Uh, if you if you haven't checked out Dr. Beal's textbook on kyphoplasty, I think it's right on the shelf above him. It's fantastic. Uh, this guy textbook. <laughs> very, very useful. Uh, and I would definitely uh, reiterate, uh, thank you, IZI, especially Jovi and Amanda. Super nice. And uh, again, I'm just so excited that we've got a company that's really listening to physicians and helping bring new innovative technology to market or back to the market. <laughs> uh, and again, thank you guys. You're fantastic. Um, the information, your expertise, all the clinical information you could pass on to everyone who's attended the call today. Thank you very much, Dr. Beal. Thank you very much, Dr. Webb. Um, if anyone has any further questions, feel free to get in touch with Amanda. We will be out and about, and uh, obviously in any way, shape, or form we can help you or give you more information, we'd be happy to do so. Everyone, thank you very much. Appreciate it. it's late in the day, and we do appreciate hanging on here, and it looks like we are literally down to the minute, 7.45 Eastern time, so we finished just in time. So thank you very much. Everyone have a fantastic evening. So when midnight comes, leave a 20 and a 5. When you come back, you'll find.